Priority One message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. You are listening to the Trek Ranks Podcast, a member of the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network. This is episode 91, featuring the top five Twilight Zone episodes of Trek. Welcome, Star Trek fans. I am Jim Morehouse, and I am the host of the Trek Race podcast. And tonight, you unlock this podcast with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of chronotons, a journey into a wondrous corridor whose boundaries are that of subspace and tetrion. The coordinates up ahead. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Imagine, if you will, a podcast about Star Trek, a show that twisted both ideas and minds as well as time to alter itself every week. Right now, three podcasters are sitting at their microphones, about to take a temporal journey through heart and reason to discuss various episodes of Star Trek. It's a journey that will take a slight detour, a detour into... The Twilight Zone. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. All right, we're here. We are ready to do Twilight Zone, Star Trek podcasting. I have two awesome guests with me. This is Jim Morehouse. Our first guest tonight is one of the women at Warp. She is the third one to join us here on Trek Ranks after Andy and Sue. So we're going to be chasing down Jara now. It's Grace Moore coming to us from the Pacific Northwest Passage. Welcome, Grace. Hey, everybody. I'm so glad to be here in the Twilight Zone. It is so much cleaner than I imagined, <laughs> i got to say. I am excited to talk Trek and Twilight Zone with an expert like you, Grace, and our second guest is coming to us from my hometown in the San Diego sector. He's a writer, including an amazing piece on Star Trek.com that you should look up. It's really, really powerful and, and great. His name is Ryan Thomas Riddle. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you for having me, Jim. I am happy to be here. Nice to, to meet you too, Grace. I can't wait to talk about the Twilight Zone, and it's nice to visit an uh, alternate universe where things make more sense. Oh, yeah. that's the major plot twist, really, of the Twilight Zone. That is actually way more functioning there than it is here. <laughs> that is really well said. It actually makes so much more sense now than our actual 20. That was the twist existence. all along. <laughs> yes, we've been waiting for it. Rod Sterling got us. Got us. <laughs> all right. So Grace and Ryan, it's been a while since we had two first time guests on the same show. So we like to get a quick Trek origin story. So I'm wondering, Grace, what's your Trek backstory? I know you're uh, a lot of people probably heard you, heard you on Women at War, but uh, how'd you get into Trek? Have you seen it all? What's your what's your favorite series? Give us a quick snapshot. Oh, let me see. Um, well, I've been watching Star Trek since I was about in middle school. It was one of those shows that was always on in syndication. So. As a nervous kid, I would always have something on in the TV. So I've got this really weirdly specific frame of knowledge uh, for sitcoms and TV shows in the late 90s and early aughts. And there was always a Star Trek on of some kind. So that's how I started watching it. Then as I got into college, got older, I started watching it a little more, how shall we say, religiously and watching it all in order. And it has kind of gone downhill for me since then. Let's be honest. I started... Um, I started podcasting on the show All Things Trek um, when they realized I'm yep. very mouthy and have a lot of opinions and <laughs> can talk about Star Trek a lot. <laughs> and after that show finished, um, some friends of mine, we decided we would really miss having that outlet. So we thought, hey, why don't we start our own um, lady-led Star Trek podcast? And that's how Women at Warp happened. And oh. I've been there ever since. So what was kind of your first Trek? Was it Next Gen? My uh, Next Gen was one of my firsts. I was l watching scattered episodes of Next Gen and Voyager. And then when I started getting more into Star Trek, the one I really got into was uh, DS9. I'm a big fan of DS9. We all are. Yeah. Uh, it always ends up being the one people like the most. It's, it is. It's, it's, it's the it one is, that the people who like it are the most willing to die on the hill of yeah, DS9. That's what sure. I've come to discover. 
Yeah, it's amazing. Okay, Ryan, how about you, man? How did you kind of get your uh, Trek origin story started? Apparently, when I was two years old, and my mom tells this story, uh, she says that whenever the opening bars of the original Star Trek theme would come on, like they would just, you know, if they'd be just flipping through the channels, and then I would run into the room and tell them, stop, don't change the channel. (laughs) 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 And just sit there transfixed watching this show. And I've been watching it ever since. Uh, You know, I started with the original uh, and that's, you know, like my bread and butter in terms of, you know, Star Trek. Because I remember every day on Channel 8 here in San Diego, yeah. every Saturday afternoon, they would show like the original Star Trek and then Mission Impossible, right? Like the old Mission Impossible right after, right? And so like I grew up kind of like on Saturdays, that's what I would watch. You know? Oh my God, you were practically raised by Leonard Nimoy then. <laughs> yeah, I was practically <laughs> raised by Leonard Nimoy, right? And then you're like, why is Spock? you know, dressed in like, you know, bell bottoms and, you know, pulling off mask. That's not Spock. Uh, But but yeah, I just, I just, ever since then, and my dad uh, brought me to conventions. He was in the Navy. That's why we were in San Diego. And so every time he'd come back to home port, you know, after being out to sea, you know, the first thing he'd do is take me to a Star Trek convention. So I have very strong memories. Uh, associated with the bonding with not only my father, but just that my father was willing to share in this love of of this show that I could not stop talking about as a kid. <laughs> so, oh, that's so sweet. That's awesome. So, so was TOS, and then and then TNG after that, pretty much. Yeah, I grew up on TNG too because I was about ten when ten or eleven when TNG premiered. Yeah. So like that was like a big that was like a big major thing, you know, yeah, <laughs> like for yeah. me when it came out. I was like, hold on, you know, recording every episode on VHS tape because I didn't know if they'd ever air them again. <laughs> yep. So yeah, the both ta- uh TOS and uh TNG are sort of my my two Trek loves. TOS more than anything else. And I've I've watched all of them to varying degrees and enjoy them all obviously on twitter you're a huge tos fan so uh yes love yeah. love that <laughs> you follow if you follow me you're gonna you're gonna hear nothing but tos <laughs> okay i love those two trek origin stories this is gonna be an awesome show let's get started now with our quick trek ranks recalibration what are you recalibrating everything um it's it's a sweeping uh, a recalibration of all systems First up, as regular listeners will know by now, general order number one here at the Trek Ranks podcast that we love Trek and we love to rank Trek via some deep dive topics just to get the conversation started. And remember, it's not about the ranks. That's just an excuse to talk about Star Trek. And as our good friend, the Vulcan Master, likes to remind us each week, the main driver for all of our discussions here at the Trek Ranks podcast is... Infinite diversity. In infinite combinations. No wrong answer. It's not about being right or definitive in any way. It's about sharing the things that we love about Star Trek. And by the way, the Vulcan Master is played by Joseph Ruskin, who famously played Galt in the game of Triskelion and is in one of the most famous episodes of the Twilight Zone ever to serve man as the voice of of the canimate alien who's cooking up some humans. Amazing. There's going to be so many Star Trek Twilight Zone connections in this episode. All right, so we love it all from TOS to TNG, straight through to Enterprise and the Kelvin timeline, and now Discovery and Short Treks and Star Trek Picard as well. It's all fair game here on the Trek Ranks podcast. Black alert. Black alert. And a reminder that this episode of Trek Ranks is current through Discovery Season 2 and the second season of Short Treks, and of course through that first amazing season of Star Trek Picard. And one final reminder that we use episodes as a shorthand term, but the 13 films are always in play as well. You know, interface, net access, channel 90. And you can find Trek Ranks on the net access interface links at trekranks.com. And you can connect with me directly on Twitter at Trek Ranks or at Enterprise Extra. You can also call and leave us a message with your own picks at 609-512-LLAP at 609-512-5527. Okay, so to wrap this all up, Grace and Ryan, why don't you guys let everybody know how they can get a hold of you on the net access interface, uh, Grace. You can usually find me chatting about 
oh, say, Star Trek on my podcast, Women at Warp, which you can find on the Roddenberry Podcast Network or any real podcast provider, to be honest. You can hear my completely amazing piping hot takes about everything from Star Trek to Batman. So is it just me or is it chilly out here on Twitter? Um, you can find me. I'm Bone Crusher Jank. That's B-O-N-E-C-R-U-S-H-E-R-J-E-N-K. There's a story behind it, but I'll never tell. Bone Crusher Jank spelled just like it sounds. I, I've always wondered what that is. Someday we'll find out. Ryan, how about you, man? Uh, you can find me on the interwebs at Ryan T. Riddle on Twitter, where I talk nothing but TOS 24-7. Um, you can also find some of my writings on my new platform, media platform that I've co-founded, avazmedia.com, uh, which is a brown geek space uh, for brown geeks and their allies. Awesome. I also write a lot of Trek there too. So <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and and find his article on Star Trek.com too, people, everybody. It's really good. Okay. I think we're ready to activate our level one diagnostic to get into today's show. Diagnostic cycle will be complete in 20 seconds. All right. So really quick, I want to talk a little bit about why we're doing this episode. There is so much similar DNA between Star Trek and, of course, the original series, and The Twilight Zone from about 10 years prior. And first, Twilight Zone is an anthology show, just like Star Trek. People kind of sometimes lose sight of that. Star Trek can be a comedy one week, a romance, action. It can be uh, a Western. It can be literally anything, just like The Twilight Zone. Second, the way Star Trek was the brainchild of Gene Roddenberry, Twilight Zone, obviously, really the the body of work of Rod Serling who wrote 92 of the hundred some odd episodes and died at a very young age at 52 in uh, 1975. And of course there's been a quite a few revivals of the twilight zone as well, including one on CBS all access right now. That's, that's not, uh, not bad. And then third, there are so many uh, acting connections. Obviously you have William Shatner's and, in some famous Twilight Zone episodes, also Leonard Nimoy and George Takei, and so many, so many guest stars and character actors that are going to come up uh, tonight in these picks. I can't wait to talk about it. Okay, so Diagnostic Cycle, we want to talk about our favorite Twilight Zone episodes really quick. I'm dying to hear this. Grace, what's your favorite episode? Or, or rattle off more than one. Let's hear it. Let me see. I've actually, I've got a list here because I adore the Twilight Zone. I don't think we would have a modern sci-fi as we have it currently as uh, as it is without the Twilight Zone. And we definitely wouldn't have had Star Trek, uh, at least the original series, without the Twilight Zone doing what it did. Especially in terms of using sci-fi as an analogy uh, to talk about social issues. Oh, yes. So a few of my favorites here... Um, I, I had to pick five because I can't narrow it down any further than that. So I've got the monsters are due on Maple Street. Uh, it's a good life because it scares me every freaking time. <laughs> Number 12 looks just like you because I think it's a really interesting examination of the social relationship that specifically teenage girls are taught to have with vanity. An occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge because I love that they just had an episode where they kind of took off and did an art house film for the Twilight Zone. And what's the what's that one about? I can't remember. That one is the one. Um, it's one of the only episodes directed by um, a non-American director. I believe it was mm. shot in France, and it's based off of a short story by Ambrose Pierce, who was a Civil War veteran and then reporter who actually mysteriously disappeared, and no one's quite sure what happened to him, but he had an incredible body of work in short stories. And an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge is basically the story of a Union soldier about to be hung off of a bridge. Yes. And then okay. making a daring escape. But it's all very surreal and very odd. And you don't really totally know what's going on until you reach the very end. And I, it's incredible. Amazing. And my last one is The Masks, um, both because I think it's a really oh. good locked room character story. And also I'm... It's really cool that Ida Lupino, uh, the woman who directed the episode, is A, the only woman to direct an original series episode of The Twilight Zone, and the only actor to come back on The Twilight Zone and direct. Oh, that's awesome. 
yeah. love that background. I didn't know that about Mass. I mean, Mass is a uh, famous episode. That is uh, fantastic. Yeah. I forgot about that occurrence at the Owl Creek Bridge. And I, I, once you described it, I remember it now. That's yeah. uh, That one is so good. I had no idea about that background and being filmed yeah. in France. Cool. How about you, Ryan? How about, what are some of your favorites? Well, I, I got to say Grace's knowledge of Twilight Zone <laughs> And deeper than the Twilight Zone itself, probably. <laughs> I feel like I'm looking at my notes going, oh, oh, I guess I should have picked more episodes. <laughs> uh, because those are all excellent and good episodes. Because for me, like, I still remember watching uh, the Twilight Zone during Thanksgiving and New Year's when they used to do those Twilight Zone marathons where they would just play it all day and night. Yeah. I would always wait like I would always wait for one particular episode when they would do that, which is Death Ship by Richard Matheson, who yes. uh, who went on to write for Star Trek. Speaking of Star Trek connections, yes. I really love that episode. I love the the setup. I love the creepiness of it. This you know finding your doppelganger, but it, you're all dead. But are you really dead? And you know, um, oh gosh, the, his name escapes me. Um, uh, Jack Klugman. Yeah, Jack Klugman plays the, this fantastic just starship captain who will just like not admit that he's dead. Like total, total starship captain mentality. I, I, I can't accept what's in front of me. I, I need to control it. We're not dead. This is, you know, whatever. We're going to get out of this situation and never give up. But the fact is, is that they're actually all dead. And now they're trapped in their own purgatory. I just love that entire set up and it's one it's and it's in that one season that's um all hour long episodes yeah i was gonna say that was season four right that, that's yeah, an hour long four. one yeah um, no, there's a ton of good stuff in that season yeah there's a ton of good stuff there's the the, the dollhouse episode um yep. and all that the uh, wax the other, museum episode the wax yep. museum episode yeah um the w- other one the other episode i picked was actually from the 1980s revival uh, which is what has always been one of my favorite episodes because it's also very creepy and it's written by uh, Joe Michael Straczynski who would go on to oh, right. write a Star Trek comic uh, but he would also go on to create Babylon 5 which was sort of his uh, shot at making uh, his own Twilight Zone his own Star Trek his own sci-fi universe yeah and um, I really loved it's called something in the walls and the episode is basically the psychiatrist goes on his first day uh, to a, a new mental institution and he encounters this woman who must have like, everything has to be, you know, bright in the room. It, like our shadows are trying to come out and replace us. And that's what she keeps telling the psychiatrist. and He doesn't believe her and all of this. And then like, it's just, it's a really creepy episode. Ooh, that sounds good. I, I'm not yeah. that up on the 1980s uh, revival. And then, the, you know, the 80s revival was also a uh, uh, story edited, or he was the creative consultant, was Harlan Ellison. So another Trek connection into my light zone. Well, have you guys watched much of the CBS All Access? I haven't had a chance to yeah. do yet. I haven't for a really silly reason. And that is, I promised myself before I watched new Twilight Zone, I would watch through all of the old Twilight Ooh, Zone. Interesting. And that's a that good didn't reason. Come together. That's a good reason. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's good. It's good. That's, you know, there's. I, I'm excited to see what they do with it. Yeah. There's been 20 episodes. I wouldn't say any of them are great. They're all a little bit. Uh, Black Mirror light at this point, so. oh. but they're 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 okay. Some are bad, but they're. Is it better than the UPN version that they? Yes, yeah, so I <laughs> oh, think it's. Gosh. I think it's the second best revival, but it's still <laughs> only okay. There's another Star Trek yes. link we can get into with right. that one with Iris yeah. Stephen Bear writing U- some of that. All right, so my I'm just gonna I'm just gonna list one. It's my favorite episode. It has been since I was a little kid. I just was fascinated by the story of it. And it's from the fifth season, and it's the self-improvement of Salvador Ross. And this episode, it it never really gets, it's not very popular. It doesn't get picked a lot, but since you probably don't recognize it, if you're listening to this podcast, it's an episode about a guy who realizes he can trade metaphysical things. So like he's in the hospital, and he's got a broken arm. And there's an old man next to him with a cough complaining about how bad his cough is and it's going to threaten his life. 
they basically they're arguing and he says, Oh, well, I'll take your cough over this broken arm. He says, Great deal. I'll trade that. Wakes up in the morning, he's got a little cough. Old man's got a broken arm. And the guy walks out of there like, Oh man, this is great. I don't have a broken arm anymore. So it's just a great story. And so he takes that and he and he figures out a way to uh, the real setup is that he basically he starts he makes a bunch of money by trading his youth to an old man for his age so all of a sudden he's an old man but then he trades with people in an elevator for like one year of their life by just giving them a thousand bucks and they think he's crazy and next thing you know he's a young man again and anyway it's really cool i'm really fascinated and it's a great twilight zone twist ending there's always so, a twist yeah always, there's a twist. always a twist we're talking about some more twists Okay, let's get into our prime directives. I do not concur with your captain's decision. She's following our prime directive. Define prime directive. Okay, so Grace, let's start with you. How, how did you define, how did you kind of narrow down your list and, and pick just five episodes? Well, I tried to pick, um, I tried to narrow it down. I wasn't able to narrow it down very well, as you can probably see, to the ones that I thought were either super influential or ones that spoke to me in a certain way. Um, I'm a horror fan. I watch scary movies all the time. So I like to think I'm a little jaded. Um, so I went with some of the ones that genuinely give me the creeps because mm. that's an accomplishment right there, especially in the world of, you know, millions and millions of direct to video sequels getting progressively gorier and scarier. I, if you can find something from, 50 years ago that's still genuinely wow. spine tingling that's an accomplishment i love that yeah and also i think that like i was saying earlier there's some really great social commentary in the twilight zone and i think that that is definitely worth paying attention to as well especially with the monsters are due on maple street it's mm. this essential piece of sci-fi metaphor for sort of mccarthyism and the paranoia that came with the 60s of everyone is against you. You don't know your neighbor could be trying to take away your American way of life and all that. And it's just some really tight, solid writing on it. It's the kind of story that never gets dated, sadly. It it's, never does because <laughs> paranoia is very human. And yeah. um, same with uh, it's a good life. It's such an essential piece of sort of the sci-fi mythos uh, of television. And the fact that, the basis for the story and that all of the terror lies in the fact that kids are assholes for one thing. Yeah. <laughs> we are all, we all start out as assholes and then we learn better because of the consequences of our actions. And this just takes something very simple, like the idea of, well, what if those consequences didn't happen and makes it horrifying. And we've got some incredible performances from, uh, Cloris Leachman and we little baby, uh, Bill Moomy, who is, I understand. Mm -hmm. Little, who, as I understand, is friends with Ira Stephen Bear, which was why he wrote a continuation for this episode in uh, the UPN reboot of The Twilight Zone. But it scares the shit out of me every time. And it's um, why he was in exactly. the Siege of AR. Part so that they that Ira Stephen Bear could stand over his body and say, we did it! We killed Will Robinson! <laughs> <know>. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> nice uh, preview for what's to come. Ryan, how about you, man? How did you kind of narrow down your your rules for for locking in your list? You know, like I I think there's a lot of uh, Serling influence, and in, certainly in Roddenberry's thinking in Star Trek, especially if you look at the first thirteen that Roddenberry actually produced before Gene Kuhn came on. Right? There's this kind of there's a lot of creepiness. There's um, the tone is a lot darker. The endings are a lot darker, um, but for there's me, definitely more ambiguity. It is more ambiguity, right? And I kind of wish that kind of continued throughout more of, of Star Trek, right? That ambiguity uh, in the endings, uh, which I really enjoyed, you know. Um, but I think for me, like what I tried to do was for me, it was a tone. Like I look, mm. I looked for episodes that resonated with a type of tone that the Twilight Zone had as opposed to looking, you know, at episodes that were exactly like the Twilight Zone, but more what their tone was, and then trying to figure out what episode was somewhat similar and why. Uh, because I think there's a lot of a lot of episodes in Trek, not only from the original series, but also in TNG and DS9 that also have this 
Twilight Zone-ish uh, feel or twist to it. And that's that's sort of where I, my thinking was when I was compiling my list. Okay, that uh, tone makes perfect sense. And for me, I, I I think tone is probably a good word to use as well. That in the episodes I was looking at from Trek, I mean, I've loved Twilight Zone my whole life. So I really first just kind of brainstormed episodes that made me think of the Twilight Zone. And then I jumped in on some Twilight Zone research that I hadn't really done in a long time. And I ended up coming up with a list of five episodes that really associated directly to one other episode of the Twilight Zone, which sounds a little bit like uh, what Grace has done. And, and then they all needed to have some kind of big Twilight Zone classic twist moment. So yeah, let's just, let's get into this. Enough of that. <laughs> let's have third Ramonaclon introduce us to the order of things. I am a Jem'Hadar. He is a Vorta. It is the order of things. Thank you, Third Ramonaclon. And as always, just a quick reminder on how we're going to go through the order of things. First, each of us will reveal our five word summary and a hashtag to tease our pick. Then we'll reveal our top five Twilight Zone episodes of Trek and the specific reasons that we're highlighting them. And at the end, we'll ask everyone for a few secondary systems picks for any uh, selections that maybe just missed our list. And as always, if you have any duplicate picks, make sure you listen for the Defiant Torpedoes. Or maybe some fun Twilight Zone sound. We'll, uh, maybe we'll add that in instead. William Shatner yelling over oh, seeing a uh, gremlin on the wing of the plane or there something. You, <laughs> there you go. There's probably a good music cue for that. Okay. <laughs> Grace, let's start with you. What's your number five pick for your Twilight Zone-like episode of Star Trek? Well, it's it's a personal favorite, and I would describe it as Kirk bluffs his way out. Hashtag bullshit your way to victory. <laughs> and that episode would be the Corbomite Maneuver. Yes, that is a great five words. I picked it because I love a good arguing your way out of a situation story, which is really something we see a lot of in the Twilight Zone. We see a lot of person A is put in situation with person B and has to find a way to kind of logic their way out of a situation, which I think is really interesting, uh, both as a, as a story and both as um, something telling us about the character. And I think this is a really good character-based episode where we get to see, like I said, we see Kirk bullshit his way out of a major incident. And yep. I, I find it very clever and entertaining and very much a sort of mind over, uh, over over machismo episode. And I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, I like the way you say that too, because there's so many Twilight Zone episodes end up just being this kind of one act play with one or two people kind of sparring yes. and, and having this little bit of a dance. It right, is a, it's a bottle episode heavy show. Exactly. Yes. The, the Twilight Zone is for sure. Yes. Uh, Ryan, how about you? What's your take on the Corbomite Maneuver? Uh, I think it's actually a quintessential Trek episode. I think it's, you know, and I, I it, it does have that Twilight Zone twist, right? With the, with the whole like Baylock. Yeah. I think it's, I think oh yeah, that's right. Yep, it does have yep. that Twilight Zone twist. It, has, yeah. it also has the tie of the creepy kid. Right. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> There's always a creepy kid. I think that might actually be Clint Howard also. Who, yeah, it uh, is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's great. Uh, and for me, Corbin Maneuver is actually one of my v- favorite first season Star Trek episodes. I think, like if if only they had aired with that first instead of my um the man trap, I think the reviews would have been a hell of a lot better in Variety and TV Guide. Uh, I mean, it. I mean, it Trek did pretty well for fifty five years since this. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's going it pretty better. well, all things it considered. <laughs> but it, but it's definitely like it's a third pilot after right. where no man has gone before because you're we're introduced to star trek proper now yes that spock his makeup isn't weird um uh, i don't know about you but i love weird weird makeup spock i like yeah i like where no man spock because i love those like really really like sharp eyebrows it just makes him look more devilish and yeah and then we get mccoy and i like and i think like the, the thing about the corporate maneuver that i that I love other than like, it's like the, the, it's very film noir looking. It does have that twilight zone look to it in terms of the way it's filmed. Um, because everything's cast in heavy shadows. Mm -hmm. But what I like most about Cobra Might Maneuver is, is that 
it's really a day in the life of the enterprise. Really, this is just kind of like they're going about their business. Kirk's getting a physical, right? McCoy's complaining that he's put on weight, puts him on a diet, and then they encounter some weird stuff. That's good. Yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah, it's just very much a day in the life of the Enterprise. And I think that goes to Roddenberry's original concept that this show would be a naturalistic space adventure drama rather than you know, like, uh, uh, like a complete action adventure uh, lost in space type show, but there would yeah. be sort of this like uh, quotidian of what it's like to live on a starship and then encounter all this weird stuff. Well said. All right, let's go to your number five pick then, uh, Ryan. What uh, what do you got? My number five pick is Charlie X. Oh, yes. Ooh. Charlie is our darling. <laughs> yes, he is. You're uh... And then hashtag Charlie is a darling. Uh, <laughs> oh, there you go. I love it. <laughs> screw that up. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, Charlie is a darling. Um, but I think like for me, this is very tonally Twilight Zone. And, you know, this goes back to actually Grease's, one of Grease's picks, because this is basically, uh, it's a good life with Bill Mooney's character all grown up, right? Yep. You know, it's, 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 it's basically Star Trek's It's a Good Life, except that he's not a kid. He's a petulant teenager, and like a, a petulant, pe- creepy, horny teenager, creepy, horny teenager trouble as Kirk describes it. He just wants, but he doesn't know why. Right. <laughs> yep. He just yep. wants, he wants it and he wants it now. You know, Robert Walker jr. Is just, he's fantastic in that episode. So he's good. just yeah. very much like this. He just, the way he looks at everyone, the way he rolls his eyes when he uses his powers He's just very captivating to watch. And it's very much like, and then the twist at the end that he was actually raised by these Thacians who he couldn't right. touch, right? right? So he didn't he didn't have that affection. He didn't, he didn't, as Grace said when she was talking about it as a good life, he didn't learn those consequences of being a child. But not only that, he didn't have them reinforced. He didn't have empathy reinforced. He didn't have, you know, compassion reinforced. So therefore, he grew up with this power where he could get anything he wants. And then he finally comes across the one thing he cannot have. And it drives him mad, as it would any teenager. Yep. He, the, the threat and danger of him throughout the episode just it feels so real. Like, what, what are you going to do? Which is exactly like, it's a good life. With, I mean, I would be terrified if I lived in that town with, with Bill Mummy and those people. And again, both of those episodes are really sold by the actor's portrayal and like Charlie being so petulant and yeah. angry. That's yeah. what makes him so scary. Yep, absolutely. This is for sure on my uh, secondary systems pick. So, and and then, I'm, like, you know, the woman with like the, the, the poor yeoman whose face is. Deep. Oh, God. Oh, uh, it's so creepy. Oh, it's that's awful. The, that, it's that's awful. Used it's to scare <laughs> me as a kid. Yeah. You know? I yeah. couldn't like I would be like, oh no. No, it's terrifying. It's literally terrifying. That it's same with it's a good life when the yeah. guy just turns into a jack in the box. That, it's like, that, oh my god. I saw that as an adult and it still gave me nightmares. It was just such a no, no, no moment. <laughs> it's terrifying. All right, let's uh, go to my round five pick. My five words and a hashtag. Four characters searching for escape. Hashtag poison. And the episode is TNG's Allegiance. And this is the classic episode where all of a sudden Picard finds himself in being held prisoner with uh, three other characters. A Mazarian who is a little bit of a pacifist and a, someone who's just going to be compliant and let, let people take over them. This Bolian and, of course, Isak from Chauna. And this episode compares directly... <laughs> Two five characters in search of an exit, a classic Twilight Zone episode. Where five. I was going to say, I love this pick yeah, because there's almost, such a direct parallel. I almost picked this one. Oh, awesome! Yeah, so there's five random characters wake up in a in a white room and don't know what they're doing. It's a clown, a hobo, a ballerina, a major who is played by William Wyndham, the famous. Scene chewing Commodore Decker from the Doomsday Machine. So I, w- I had no idea. I was watching this for research and I'm like, 
Kind of looks familiar. He sounds, oh my God, it's Commodore Decker. I am definitely picking this. It was crazy. They really don't <laughs> choose scenery like they used to. Oh my they really God. don't. And in this episode, he plays a major and he's like telling the hobo and the clown, like, we got to get out of here. What are we doing? Let's figure there out. There is no fourth <laughs> planet. Oh my God. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. Um, and of course, the twist at the end of this episode is that the Bolian ensign was one of the alien captors all along. And, uh, they were just playing, uh, testing these four. And at the end, there's actually a pretty good message about communication, a little, little Trek morality play on captivity and, and how we communicate and things. So really fun Twilight Zone setup uh, from this one. Uh, Grace, what's your take on Allegiance and five characters in search of an exit? Well, I got to say, um, I love both of these um, because they both do the same thing, but in their own sort of spin on it. And that is the characters all being locked in a room and yeah. having to sort of figure out what's going on. Yeah. And um, I love this from a theatrical stance because it it's another one that's dependent on all the characters being able to interact interestingly, being able to sort of sell their own individual performances while working as a conceptual unit. And it is such a examination of the characters how they work together and whoever you pick as your main character in either scenario you really really have to think about it and you have to know that how they handle this is going to be an examination of that character as a whole yeah uh, by the way at the end of five characters in search of an exit it turns out they were just toy dolls inside a bucket outside a dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> the salvation army at christmas like a donation bucket for old toys it's sad toy story is what <laughs> it's it so is sad. it's so toy sad story. <laughs> ryan any any quick take on allegiance yeah i almost put this episode on my list it was like one of the ones i had to like i crossed out yep. like what i love the most about it and grace already hit on it is that it's just a it's a simple story in a self-contained space, right? You just have these five or six characters in this one space trying to figure out this problem and trying to get out and how each of their own personalities come into conflict with each other. That's something that I feel is lost a lot in like a lot of television is this that simple story, that self-contained story in one space and letting the characters and the actors just play off each other. Yeah in trying to get together to get out of this situation. Well, I always wonder how much of that is based around the fact that uh, they don't have to do the bottle episode so much anymore um, in TV and especially in Star yeah. Trek, the further on it goes, because there's more of a budget. You have more, more capabilities with tech. There's more you can do. You don't have to limit it all to a single room. And I do kind of wonder what more we could get out of that concept if we stuck with it a little more. It's probably why it stands out so much now when you yes. see it. It's yes. just like anytime right. you just slow it all down, you slow the pacing down. I I, I love it. It's part of what makes the community time. bottle episode work so well. Yep. Yes. All right. <laughs> okay, let's go to Do round the bottle episode. <laughs> we did we did top five bottle episodes, like fifty episodes. <laughs> oh, fabulous! On Trek rank, so awesome. that was a good one. Okay, let's uh, go to round four. Grace, what's your number four pick? Well, this is going to be kind of an obvious one, but I've got my description. Mirror universe shenanigans? Oh, no! <laughs> Hashtag ripped in Machiavellian, which was actually the title we used for our Mirror Universe episode on Women at Warp. And obviously, it's Mirror Mirror. <laughs> yes, this is on my secondary systems for sure. Yeah, why'd you pick it? Well, it's such an iconic episode, for one thing. This is the episode that put the idea into sort of the pop culture realm of there's a mirror universe where there's an evil version of you and it's got a goatee that's become yeah. such sort of a staple of pop culture and there's this major twilight zone connection there with this episode and by proxy the whole mirror universe concept as we know it in star trek being written by jerome bixby who was the writer of uh, one of my twilight zone picks it's a good life oh my god so yes. one of the amazing things about looking at the overlap between star trek and the twilight zone is seeing this sort of collision of all of these writers and creators uh, at a very seminal point in the growth of science fiction, sort of having these little brushes with each other in the world of television. And that's one of the interesting crossovers, I think. We see a lot of the same ideas and a lot of the same writers kind of overlap. I love it. There's so many great connections like that. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, any take on Mirror Mirror? It's, you know, it's it's just a classic episode that gets, like, referenced in pop culture all the time. I mean, anytime someone wears a goatee, 
they're automatically evil. They're from an evil reality, right? Like yeah. Community's done it, and it, it's 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 definitely in my top ten of uh, Star Trek episodes. And you gotta love the the speech Kurt gives at the end of that episode. Right, that is such a great speech. And you know, in every revolution, there's one man with a vision. He plead and he pleads to the logic side of Spock. He pleads logically. He lays out a logical argument, not an emotional one. He lays out a logical argument. I just that that ending and then leaving it like to whatever fate that universe is going to have. I just think it's a brilliant episode. It is. It absolutely is. It is genre defining to say the least. It is a beautifully shot episode. We get to see all of the actors take their own turn in giving incredible performances. It's it's such an important Star Trek episode. I'm excited by that, Jerome. Big speed connection, too. Yeah. So, All right, Ryan, how about you? What's your number four episode? My number four, and it's real. It's real. Uh, it yes, is real. It's real. <laughs> uh, far Beyond the Stars, Deep Space Nine. Oh, man. Incredible yeah, episode. It is an incredible episode. It's a daring episode, really, for Star Trek. Oh, much so. Because I think, you know, like, we have, we have the allegory of racism. In, in TOS with, you know, let this, let this be your last battlefield, right? The, the, the on the nose allegory, right? Mm-hmm. But this one is more, it, it's subtle and it, it feels more real because now we're being transported to a time where there was that overt racism and there's still that overt racism today. And it's still such a powerful episode because of those reasons. You know, it, it said, and, and I love that Cisco acknowledges not only in this episode, but in, in the episode where they go to the hollow suite. Bada bing, bada bang. Yeah, bada bing, yeah, bada yeah. bang. Where Cisco really has a big problem with going into this sanitized version of history, right? Because he yeah. has this point of view is it's like, this happened to us. We can't just sweep it under the rug, even though we're living in this more idealized perfect future we still have to understand the history and make sure that it doesn't happen again and what i love about this episode is not only is it twilight zone but it asks a very crucial sort of twilight zone question about the nature of reality who is the dreamer and what is the dream who is the real person and who is not so who's creating whom right and cisco's dad as the preacher says, you are the dreamer in the dream, right? That just, it just evokes to me a very Twilight Zone concept. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, you are both, you know, you are the dreamer and the dream. And, and, and I love that because in the, you know, for someone to have written, and there was actually, a, a, in the 1950s, there was an EC Comics that, that did try to do yes, this. Yes, that this is a direct right. reference to, yeah. yeah. You know, they changed the the drawing from a, a black astronaut at the end to a white astronaut, which kind of undercuts the point of the whole the, the whole comic. And I, for me, this this episode evokes two Twilight Zone episodes: one that actually deals with racism, and then one that deals with this concept of a writer creating his own dream, or creating his own world, or creating his own characters that come to life. And the first one is more of a funny episode, which is a world of his own. Yes. <laughs> yes. Writer, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, which is the writer who, you know, he, he writes himself, a mi- he creates himself a mistress. Yeah. And then the twist is he also created his wife who's jealous of the mistress. <laughs> <laughs> and then the bigger twist at the end is, is that he created Rod Surly. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, you know, so that, that, that invoked to me this idea of, you know, Benny Russell is, is is the creator of Deep Space Nine. And I know that Iris Stephen Bear really wanted to kind of end the finale with, you know, like you right. pull back the set and there is, you know, Benny Russell sleeping with the, the Deep yeah. Space Nine script in hand, right? What uh, what was the other Twilight Zone episode? Oh, the other one is um, I Am the Night, Color Me Black. Oh, yeah. Which deals with racism. And the only reason, one of the main reasons I picked this is because both it, the reverend in that episode that basically calls everyone out on their hatred. Gosh, it's a powerful episode. You hated, therefore he died. He hated, and that other guy died. And we all hate each other. That's why it's 
it's it's the darkness is overtaking us. There are people right? who say it's it's kind of a heavy handed. Uh, the, the analogy is very thin, and it's kind of a heavy handed episode, but it gets the point across. And yeah. by the end, it forces you to sit with this idea. And I think that was the point of the script, and that's incredible. Yeah, I don't think that one's heavy handed because it feels so real. Mm-hmm. Well, let's be honest. Anytime you try and take a piece of science fiction and try and make it do something relevant or do something a little daring with it, you're going to get people saying that was heavy handed. Yeah, yeah. Of, course. of course. And part yeah. of what I love about this pick of an episode uh, is that aspect. The fact that Star Trek has this long standing history ever since uh, the original series of, again, using sci fi as this analogy, as this kind of shield with which to talk about sensitive subjects because apparently people don't notice it if it's in space. But the idea with far beyond the stars being that even if you are someone who has watched all of Star Trek, even if you are someone who has sat through every episode where the analogy was racism's not okay. Right. It's, it's to the detriment of all of humanity. The fact is that when deep space nine came around, there were still people acting in opposition of a black captain being the main character. There were still people policing his delivery, his appearance. And the fact is that this is reaching a point in Star Trek where the writers really say, you know what? Clearly the analogy isn't coming through to you. So we've just got to make this shit obvious. Right. And that of course made a lot of people angry. And I think that's part of why it's so important. Yeah. Well said. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I climb on a soapbox there? (laughs) Oh, I, (laughs) We love soapboxes here. <laughs> we apologize to no one. Okay, let's uh, go. Oh, it's my round four pick. Also, Deep Space Nine. Five what? words. Five words and a hashtag. To suffer as they suffered. Hashtag. To die as they died. And the episode is Things Past from Deep Space Nine season five. Ooh. Episode number eight. This is the one where. Odo ends up back on Tarok Nor and he's and they're reliving this moment in his past and he realizes that what they're witnessing is himself executing three innocent Bajoran characters and he's kind of they're they're in some kind of you know temporal Star Trek techno babble loopy thing but it's a really strong moody episode of DS9 with some great insight into Odo. And the episode I compare it to from the Twilight Zone is one of my favorites is Judgment Night. Oh, where yes. this uh, U boat commander wakes up on board this boat. There's no idea what he's doing there. And he's talking to people and he's kind of slowly remembering that his past and that, and he, and he realizes, Oh boy, I'm on this boat, but I'm the captain out on the U boat about to blow up this boat. And he's so it's the story, of course, is that he's in uh, purgatory and reliving that night over and over again. And that's what what Odo's dealing with, having to relive a moment from his past that uh, where he made a mistake and uh, three innocent people were were uh, were killed. And so that's the classic Twilight Zone twist that Thrax, played by Kurtwood Smith, uh, is actually Odo. Yeah, and, but here, Kurtwood Smith gives an incredible performance uh, in this one. Can we just give him props for that? He is he's so good. But here's my favorite unbelievable connection to Star Trek from from this pick. The actor in Judgment Night is named Nehemiah Persaw. Mm-hmm. And he played the, the the U-boat commander. He's 101 years old. He's still alive. What? And he, Seriously? and he played one of my favorite characters in TNG. Paylor Toff from The Most Toys. You're kidding! Uh, Steve Aspajo's illustrious friend who comes... You're to- kidding! That <laughs> was him? Yes, it's the same guy who played the Oh Judgment my Night. god! I know, it's absolutely incredible. And he's 101 years old. And still oh, not, wow! So. <laughs> absolutely crazy. Alright, oh, so god. any uh, any take on things past and Judgment Night, Grace? Well, I really love that um, you connected this. We've got a lot of episodes of The Twilight Zone that are takes on uh, World War II and yeah. sort of its after effects in American society. And this is a rant I'll go on a lot. And that uh, another one I know um, <laughs> is that Deep Space Nine is this really interesting take on not just this idea of sort of the post-war fallout of different communities forced together, but as far as depictions in American culture goes, 
it's probably one of the furthest um, depictions, I think, that we've seen, albeit through an analogy of post-World War II American guilt, wherein the Federation is the stand-in for America, watching sort of the fallout of after a war where they only really came in at the last minute, and the fact that all of this suffering through their inaction makes them kind of complicit. And we see that come up a lot when we're talking about uh, the Bajorans as an analogy for the Jews in World War II, the really clear Nazi visuals with the Cardassians. And so I think it's really cool that you tied those two together because of that. It's really Mm -hmm. an interesting analysis, again, of how even though this was very clearly post-World War II, America was so deeply affected, the world was affected and completely changed But there's this level culturally of not really addressing the fact that America could have turned the tide a lot sooner. Yeah. And the same with the Federation in uh, the war between Bajor and Cardassia. Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of duality there. Yeah. What I like about what Grace said, and I just kind of wanted to pick up on that in terms of this post-war and should the Federation have intervened sooner, it, 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 you know, I hadn't thought about this until now, but it reframes Deep Space Nine for me because then Deep Space Nine is basically a treatise on the morality or the ethics of the Prime Directive. Yeah. I hadn't seen it that way before, but it is because, you know, I always examine the Prime Directive myself as being this sort of, is it a good thing or is it not a good thing? And, you know, we get that a little bit with Kirk. But then Deep Space Nine now is this, now I can see it as this, like, what is the legality and the morality of the Prime Directive? Yeah. Is it actually effective? We had the means. And, and and I think that it actually kind of delves into now Picard too, right? Mm-hmm. This idea of we have the means to help, but we decided not to. And does that keep our hands clean or does that make our hands dirtier? Exactly. Yeah. I like that you bring up that ambiguity and I, now I can see deep space nine in a different way than I haven't seen it before. I don't revisit a lot as I do TOS and TNG, but now that you brought that up, I'm going to have to revisit this series from beginning to end and view it with that lens. It definitely adds a whole other level to Cisco's reluctance to be there and Cisco's, Cisco's reluctance to be the emissary basically. Yep. And Cisco's a great character. Absolutely. For sure. Okay, let's go to the soup round, round three. And now, as I'm sure that somebody out there has said, it's time to pay for the soup. Grace, what's your number three pick? Well, this one's going to be another obvious one. My five word summary is Me thinks the play's the thing. <laughs> Hashtag everyone's a critic. <laughs> and this one is pretty obviously the conscience of the king i figured it was yeah because i love a good uh story within a story i'm a sucker for it and also i um i love a good theatrical episode which is really one of the strong suits of the original episode and i think that both those are aspects that play into the twilight zone a lot the fact that as a show as an early tv show there's a lot of theatricality going into it both in terms of performance and how you have to set up your sets and your shot but also story within a story is just a very Twilight Zone concept to me. Plus there's a twist at the end, which is great. Yes. It was Lenora all along. Dun, dun, dun. Killing everybody. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, what was your take? The original Star Trek in itself is very theatrical. It's very... Very uh, much so. Very I mean, Breckian, right? It's yeah. very like there is this artifice to the original Star Trek, right? Yep. Maybe that's a, 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 an affect of budget, but I think for me, it creates this wonderful artificial world that is very theatrical and does really play well to that. And, and, and the Twilight Zone and even the Outer Limits of that era are very much theatrical shows. Everything feels like it's on a stage. Yep, exactly. And not in like this real physical location that you can go visit. There's this Diana Mulder quote, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, that she saw uh, the original Star Trek series as kind of being like children's theater because it's all set up to be, vis- everything's visually very obvious, everything's brightly colored so that your eye is drawn to where it needs to go. Like that, she kind of, I guess, saw it as like the Chuck E. Cheese of early television. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you said that it is 
it, every episode feels like it's on a stage for especially mm-hmm. early TOS and almost every episode of Twilight. Which is something we've got with the Twilight Zone also because yeah, exactly. a lot of the that's where a lot of the early translation into television is coming through. There's a lot of people with a theatrical background who are just being put in front of a camera and mm-hmm. seeing what happens with that. Like I said, I love the story within a story aspect of drawing all the parallels between this very strange conceptual sci-fi story of a fascist who killed a bunch of people and a performance of Hamlet that's going on on a stage in a starship. And there's so many layers to that to delve into that I think Rod Serling would be proud of that. Yep. Also, Lenora just gets Lenora just gets some wacky ass outfits. Oh, she's <laughs> she is so she's so good in this episode. And it's so of its time, but it's yes. so it's so riveting to watch the way her performance. It's just fantastic. You know, and, and what's interesting about that episode is is that you know not only is it a great Kirk episode, but there's also parallels with Kirk and Hamlet because Roddenberry originally envisioned him to be this sort of Horatio Hornblower slash. Yes, Hamlet. yes, that's he's part of the original concept friend. for the show, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's part of the original concept is, is that he's this space-born Horatio Hornblower meets Hamlet who's constantly filled with own, his own inner demons and his own self-doubt over every decision he makes. Yeah. Okay, Ryan, how about you? What's your round three pick? My round three pick is maybe you need another treatment. <laughs> Hashtag Riker goes mental. Oh. Yes. This episode, speaking of theatrical, right? Yeah, no mm-hmm. kidding. And also, yeah. speaking it's, of having a story within a story. Oh my God. Yeah, this, this is such a great companion to play, frame of mind, right? Yeah. And he's stuck in it. But then you're like, he doesn't know whether or not he's actually in a mental hospital or if it's the play bleeding in and he's not getting enough sleep and he's just going nuts. And then I, but what I love about this is, is that it's just very like, it's, 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 it's one of the few next generation episodes where it's just, it's really dark and heavy shadows in the mental hospital. And all the sets have these weird angles, just like an eye of the beholder with all the weird hospital angles. Yeah. And you just, it's all very German expressionist. Yeah. Very all, yeah. German expressionist. And it has that, it, it just, it has that freaky nature that uh, that Eye of the Beholder also has, where you don't know where you're going and what's going on. And then, you know, when Riker's, you know, just trying to escape from the mental hospital, he shatters into all those bits of glasses. It's so surreal. It invokes a lot of like Charles Beaumont's writing for me in that. Oh, episode. absolutely. Okay, yeah. so I was I was gonna say that, but yeah. keep going. Because like in Perchance to Dream, you know, there's that guy who thinks he like. If I fall asleep, I'm you know. If I fall asleep, the girl's gonna get me. I'm gonna die. And he goes to that fun house, right, uh, or that uh, that uh, amusement park, and it's very much like the hospital in Frame of Mind, where it's just it, it's surreal. It feels artificial. It feels like a stage, and you know, like, and then you have that moment where it is literally in that episode. Riker's on a stage, yes, <laughs> performing yep. this play. And then it's like he's he's having all these like flashes where it's data. It's the it's the hospital attendant. It's data. You know, it, that's very Charles Beaumont, and it's very much like Perchance to Dream because then he sees the secretary who looks like the girl in his dream, and then he jumps out the window. You bet I'm agitated. You're becoming agitated. You bet I'm agitated. I may be surrounded by insanity, but I am not insane. Yeah, and then there's a twist <laughs> too in Frame of Mind because it's like. He's not neither on the Enterprise or in the mental hospital. He's yeah. hooked up to some machine. He's asleep trying to use it as a defense mechanism to kind yeah, of fight exactly. him up. Yeah, exactly. Hey, so it's funny you mentioned Charles Beaumont because I was thinking about when you said this, that one of the episodes he wrote was Person or Persons Unknown. Yes. Which is yeah. exactly like this too because yes! the guy, guy wakes up and he's nobody knows who he is. And he's like, no, you're my wife. I've never seen you before. Get out of my house. Yeah. He goes to work. Hey Chuck, how's it going? Yes. Why are you here? You don't work here, and he, it's amazing. And he's like losing his mind trying to like prove that he knows all these people. And there's a scene in that one where he jumps through a window, just like Riker kind of yes. crashes through the glass. It's that's yeah. crazy. 
That's one of the, one of these things I love about original Twilight Zone is you can you can pick an influential sci-fi and horror short story writer and just kill an afternoon watching all of the Twilight Zone yes, or so other funny. anthology series episodes based off of their writing. And I've totally done that before. Oh my god. Well, okay, before I go to my pick, do you guys know the Charles Beaumont backstory too? Yeah. Uh, he is a Twilight Zone episode. So he uh do tell. He wrote he he wrote like twenty two episodes. He died at the age of thirty eight from this like weird brain disease that he like rapidly aged. What? Yes, what? look it up. It's crazy. Holy shit! They think it was based on like his drug abuse and just the, the and not even like regular drugs, just like some weird drugs that he used in the, at the time to to write. But he had this weird brain disease and basically. They, they, it's like the, the old age disease is what they call it. And he died when he was 38. I mean, and he wrote 22 wow. episodes. It's crazy. Between this guy and Ambrose <laughs> Bierce mysteriously disappearing, there are so many of these writers who, I, you know, I, their imagine is, imagination is indicative of a really weird world that they right. live in. Yeah, I've got another creepy one coming up in one of my picks. All right, so mm-hmm. let's go to my number three pick. Five words and a hashtag. Hello, Miles. Welcome to hell. Hashtag 20 years in prison. Of course, it is hard time from Deep Space Nine. And everyone knows this episode is the one. Most (laughs) intense example of O'Brien must suffer. (laughs) Yes, the most intense example of that for sure. And he's in prison for 20 years, but it's really only a couple of days. And maybe even a couple hours. It's a little bit different, but it's kind of the same. I, I, The Twilight Zone similarity for me with this one is the scariest episode of Twilight Zone ever, bar none. Ah, no, I take that back. Maybe Talking Tina's more scary. But this My one is... name is Talkie <laughs> Tina, and I don't like you. Don't do that again. Okay. All dolls are creepy. All dolls are creepy. The, uh... It's even better when you realize that that voice actress was the voice of Rocky the Squirrel. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, no. I'll yeah. never <laughs> My, ever again. My episode is <laughs> The Hitchhiker. Oh, fuck. oh, that one's man. amazing. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you that I rewatched The Hitchhiker like two days ago in research in the middle of the afternoon, all, you know, bright as possibly. And I was, I mean, terrified. A couple of times I just like my skin was crawling when this hitchhiker shows up in the background. So that episode is about a woman driving across country and she keeps seeing the same hitchhiker. He doesn't really talk to her. And, and it, the, the twist at the end is that. She actually died at the very beginning of the uh, episode, and he's there to kind of pick her up and take her to the afterlife. So he is her chair on. on. He and he, so he's basically going yeah. west. <laughs> so. Heading west? No, no, I'm not heading west. I'm sorry. I'm not heading west. I'm just going up the road a little ways. So Echar is like the hitchhiker in uh, in hard time. Keeps showing up to uh, to talk to Miles and uh, and getting his head. And of course, the twist in that episode is that not not only that that Miles was not alone the whole time, like he had told everybody, but that he murdered his his cellmate uh, through his madness of being there. So God, just a really, 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 really uh, amazing. Brutal episode. This, this is a, this is a Rod Sterling. Uh, script the hitchhiker and uh, a robert hewitt wolf script for a uh, hard time okay if any, i can uh, point it out though the yeah. twilight the script for the episode is based off of a play by lucille fletcher mm. um, for radio who was actually the wife of composer bernard harriman who is best known probably for doing the the music from psycho the ree, 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 oh, um, t- which i just think is an interesting fact yeah that is actually and then I, the, oh this is that i was gonna i have it in my notes the actress Inger Stevens, she yeah. died when she was thirty-five, like ten oh years God. after what? this. I know it's so oh, creepy. that's so sad. I know it was like. They, Can they, I also just say, for the record, that that episode, uh, I assume, hits to an extra creepy uh, level of scary if you are a single woman. Of course, I who mean, has ever had to travel oh, at night? I mean, I can't even fathom that. That yeah. that that whole level of it is just a whole nother level of. Creepy. It's one of those so. ones where I I watched it with some friends at like a party, and then it was like I gotta call my mom and just be like, "Hey, everything okay? Yeah, well, let's uh, just talk for a while. Everything's cool." One of the calming parts of the episode is when the uh, sailor shows up at like midnight to help yes. her, and I'm like, "No, that's 
that's even more creepy. It's like, you know, <laughs> this guy, I don't want this guy anywhere near her. This is not good. But at the same time, if, if you're a woman and you've been in a scary situation where you think you're being followed or something, you'll be, you will look for anything that can help you and be like, okay. Oh, Hey, 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 let's walk in the same direction for a while. Yeah. That's pretty much what it was. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, any quick take on hard time? Uh, yeah. I, you know, the thing I, that I like most about this episode is that it actually deals with PTSD in Star Trek. Yeah. Because there's a lot of like, when it's you a think very about it, socially relevant episode. It really does. You know, it, it's one of those aspects of Star Trek that they never really explore most of the time is that, you know, you go down to these alien planets, you do all this stuff and there's some horrific stuff that happens on landing parties and, <laughs> and especially in the original series. And it's just like, they don't really deal with the after effects with that. It just kind of like, okay, it's on to the next adventure. But this episode really takes a, a deep dive into how one thing can really mess you up. And that scene where O'Brien has the phaser. Oh God. The, oh, so his sad. Chin is yeah. just amazing. And you know, Cole Meany just acts the hell out of that moment. And it feels so real and you just feel his pain. And having gone, having, you know, and I'm sure all of us have trauma in our past, but having in recent years gone through some, some trauma, you know, that, that, that the way O'Brien is feels so disconnected from everyone is how I felt for a few years. Just yeah. like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't be in a room with certain people. I couldn't even go outside of my apartment in the, especially in the early months of after my trauma so like that just it's just so that episode is so visceral and so real in what it's trying to do it's so hard to watch especially when you consider the fact that it's a sci-fi analogy that involves trying to readjust after being imprisoned yeah and you can't watch it without stopping and thinking yeah this is a thing that happens every day to people who are released from prison there is a huge gap between the world as you know it in there and the world as you know it out there and as much as the people around you any loved ones any support system you might have want to help they have no idea what you've been through and so this isolating trauma is made doubly isolating and yeah oh man it's brutal well well said ryan all right let's go to round two grace grace what's your number two pick Well, this one I went with uh, my five word summary is family planning is a big issue. Hashtag sci-fi makes it safe for prime time. (laughs) So I went with the Mark of Gideon because holy hell, we have a prime time TV show in the 60s talking about the importance of family planning and birth control. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. This is not my secondary system. Awesome pick. Yeah, we um, we we're getting ready to do an episode about environmental impact in episode of Star Trek episodes of Star Trek for women at warp. And we used some screen caps of this where basically it's Kirk talking about uh, these people and saying, Hey, we can provide contraception for you guys. This is something you can do to take control over your own lives and free yourselves of this huge population boom burden that's been put on you. And, people were responding to our screen caps of it being like, this is from swear tracks, right? I would think I would have remembered if they'd said right. this on TV in the sixties. It's like, <laughs> they did. You know, it's amazing. And it's such a solid example of how, if you put it in the sci-fi frame of mind, um, it makes a lot of concepts safer and more palatable for a TV audience. Right. I, I always go back to this when talking about the twilight zone. Cause it's, it's such an important aspect, both of, how Rod Serling was approaching the idea of horror and sci-fi and how we talk about analogy in the arts and what it can be saying in terms of social relevance. Yeah. Uh, Rod Serling realizing that sci-fi has this incredible power of analogy in which you can talk about things that are otherwise considered a taboo subject to approach. And there's this amazing Mike Wallace interview with Rod Serling where he's talking about the Twilight Zone upcoming and Mike Wallace is just like, well, I guess you've given up on the serious stuff and you can just see Rod kind of seething like, oh, bitch, you don't even know. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I was amazed by Mark of Gideon that uh, the the leader of the Gideons is like, no, 
we, we don't need birth control. I'd just rather sacrifice my daughter and yeah. get a bunch of people sick. Like, oh my God. Which is weird because we're kind of that now. We can't prevent chill- babies from happening because they're sacred. We're just going to kill people in the street. Yeah, and, pretty and now we get people saying, well, how come you're making Star Trek all political all of a sudden? Yeah, uh, It's always been political. <laughs> <laughs> Did you watch the show? Star Trek political since 1966, folks. <laughs> Yeah, Mark of Gideon was one that I also considered. <laughs> yeah, me too. Because it's it's you know it's it, not only that it's got that horror element like when they look out the the viewport and there's all those bodies. It's a very Twilight Zone image. Ah, uh, so creepy. Yes. Yeah, it's so creepy, and you know, you hear all our heartbeats through the hall. Oh god, yeah. Like, oh my god, <laughs> it makes you forget for a moment. Like, if this pop planet's overpopulated how the heck did they build an exact replica and all like 22 decks in the enterprise you don't want to know ryan you don't want to know. <laughs> i just you just ignore that part of the episode yeah. it's almost like societies will go to incredible lengths to work around and ignore the actual problem exactly yeah i think that's that's actually market gideon is a good allegory for what we're seeing today too Absolutely. Well, like we'd rather sacrifice. We we, we ra- rather than address the real problem, we'd rather sacrifice lives and mask the problem, which is yeah. what they're doing in that episode. Ooh. While denying birth control. <laughs> Literally. Anywho, medical rights are human rights. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I, I got an idea. How about they redo the episode mass with masks <laughs> for all the non mass wearers, so they get stuck on their face. I'm Good, cutting that shut out. them the hell up. I'm cutting that out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, how about you? What's your number two pick? My number two pick, can half a man live? Hashtag funky alien dog. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I love that dog. I love that dog so much. You know, I picked The Enemy Within because what, primarily one because it was written by Richard Matheson, who wrote... Uh, crap ton of Twilight Zone episodes. You wouldn't have the yeah. Twilight Zone without Richard Matheson. Yeah. No. Without, without Charles Beaumont, without Richard Matheson, there would basically be no Twilight Zone. It would just be Rod alone in a room on a typewriter. <laughs> yeah. He'd be dictating into his dictaphone, like, you know, all his stories. But um, Submitted for my approval. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good Rod Serling. <laughs> I've, I've been working on it. Uh, but I think, like, this... This episode does what a lot of Twilight Zone episodes do, and the exploration of what actually drives a man. Uh, I think there's a bunch of that theme running through all throughout Twilight Zone. Does it, you know, you could pick several episodes, and it's always about what drives a man, right? And that's what this episode does, except that it's splitting it too uh, into good and evil. And what I love about this episode is that it, it, it's very daring in what it says about what really drives a human. And it's not really, while, while, we, ha- while we always want to think that it's our good, compassionate side, our animalistic and darker nature is what gives Kirk his ability to command. But what it needs in order to actually be a whole person is that compassionate, empathetic side. And it's, it's a very gray episode, you know, and it really says that we have to embrace this darker nature. We have to accept it. We have to make it part of ourselves. We can't ignore it. We can't live without that part. Can half a man live? No, we cannot. Which is very interesting because I always use this episode to point out the the difference between Kirk and Picard as people. Kirk is willing to accept his less than nature, his darker nature. In fact, the end of the episode is he has to actually literally hug it out with himself to become whole again. Whereas when Picard meets his negative duplicate, he just shoots him and goes, "Eh, he doesn't exist. (laughs) Ironic because people are always playing up Picard as the more intellectual of the two and Kirk is the more (laughs) fight it out one. Yeah. Whereas Picard's like, yeah, I don't like that part of me. I'm just going to kill it. (laughs) Whereas Kirk is always constantly in, in, in this, uh, on we, of balancing out his darker nature and his intellectual side. And he's always trying to, to balance those two throughout the original series. Kirk allows himself to be hyper emotional, but also he tries to balance that out with rationality. And he does, he's not afraid of his emotions and he lets them bleed out. 
And that's something I relate to a lot because I can be a highly emotional and very overdramatic person myself. So I think for this episode, this episode for me has a lot of Twilight Zone themes, while not necessarily pointing to a specific episode. And the only episode that I really could say that is maybe a direct line to this one is Mirror Image, where it's the woman in the bus station. Yeah. And she she sees like her duplicate getting on the bus and driving away right. and she's going mad. I that's the closest I could come to an episode. That's pretty good. But I think like, it's a theme thing mostly. Yeah. One of the things I really love about that Twilight Zone episode and part of what makes it so creepy is we don't know what this doppelganger is up to. She just knows that she that she's there and it's like why are you here? What 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 do you want? We have no idea. And that's yeah part of the creepiness of it and also where the where the guy is chasing his own doppelganger the yeah. doppelganger has this like wicked smile on his face and is looking back kind of taunting him so it's kind of goes back to like what are they really gonna do when they replace us it, right. go, it all goes back to that old um mythological idea of the changeling of you yeah. can be swapped out for someone or something who looks just like you and that's one of the scariest things that's resonated with humanity over the years. The idea that you can be replaced and your loved ones won't notice. Yeah. And there are a lot of Twilight Zone episodes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, no kidding. <laughs> that play in, the, in that in that world. Yeah. Uh, that's an awesome pick. I definitely considered it too. So, um, Okay. Let's go to my round two pick to close out the second round. Five words and a hashtag. The scope of my crime, hashtag, all who snuck wiped from existence, and it is oh. the survivors from TNG season three. Ooh, yes. And Sick. so there's a couple of reasons I picked this one. I This is like the first episode I thought of, actually. I've always thought of this episode since it first aired as very, very Twilight Zone-like mystery, where it's just this really slow kind of buildup of what are these two people doing and the ending, this great Twilight Zone twist when Kevin Uxbridge turns out to be an all-powerful being living as a human, and he and in a fit of rage, he wiped all the Hoosnock from the face of existence. And it's just this really massive moment where it's just like, I mean, Picard literally says, we don't have a way to, to judge the crimes that, that you're guilty of. But I, so again, I'm doing some research on this and I always recognize this guy, John Anderson, the actor, he was in like three major Twilight Zone episodes. He was the, he was the captain in the Odyssey of Flight 83. Ah, oh my God. Which is amazing. (laughs) And even more so, he's like, he's the, the lead in Old Man in the Cave. My God, Burbank is a small town. <laughs> I know it's unbelievable. So in in Old Man in the Cave, he's just amazing, uh, and that's another episode that just really lines up with where we are in today's world, and just not uh, wanting to listen to science and reason. So yeah, I love this episode. It's an amazing, uh, amazing kind of. Oh, by the way, that actor's name is John Anderson. Um, Grace, what's your take on the survivors? Uh, it's a creepy one. I'm, I'm always, uh, that's, that's <laughs> put that down as my official take. Uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Brian, how about you? Good tea. Nice house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, I don't, I, it's a, I love that episode. I, it's, it's, I, and I love that sort of somber ending. Whereas like the card basically gives up and says like, we just have to leave the man alone because we. Can yeah, what am I going to do? Take him to a star. Like yeah, what am I going to do? Just take him to a star base and throw yeah. him in jail? He's an all-powerful being. He just erased everybody. There's not really any punishment we can. I don't know. Maybe call here. in the queue or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually think that leaving him on the planet in that fantasy life with his, with the recreation of his wife and house. Yeah. On a planet of his, his own uh, mistake. After a while, it's going to become his own torture. It's, it's, yeah, it's going to become it's. It, Picard yeah. actually stranded him in hell. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Awesome. which is also a Twilight Zone episode, isn't yes, it? We've got the episode true. where the guy dies and 
goes to hell, but it's everything he's ever wanted, and he always gets what he wants. And right. then oh, he right. realizes that that's hell. Yeah, that's right. That is the bad place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Them messing with Troy's head just creeps me out so much. Yeah, that, that's, that's the part so that's so good in that. Yeah. It's oh, hard. God. It's hard to watch those scenes where she's being tortured by the music. So. Make it stop! I'm like, <sighs> oh my god! Yes, All right, let's do it. Let's go to round one. Grace, what's your number one pick? Well, I went. I went schmaltzy with my description. Ooh. Hope is the future seed. Hashtag believe it can be and make it so. So I went with the city on the edge of forever. Such a classic oh, it's my favorite <laughs> it's always on people's best of list for yeah. good reason it's incredible and aside from it being this really interesting plot and this sort of beautiful message of all it takes is the desire to make things better in the world to help make things be better in the world and that's the start of the action that can change the world um on the less fun note i kind of part of why i put it in is because harlan ellison I can't talk, you can't talk about Star Trek without talking about Harlan Ellison, and you can't talk about Harlan Ellison without talking about some problematic shit. (laughs) I am not going to disagree with you. (laughs) Which is part of the whole experience with talking critically about Star Trek, for one thing, and about science fiction in general. You do not get to talk about science fiction as we know it without taking a minute to at least address some of the really problematic shit there. And yeah. you can't talk about the importance of the foundational rules of robots without talking about the fact that, yeah, and as Asim- Isaac Asimov wasn't allowed in a room with women because he would just rope them like crazy. Yep. You need to, and that's important. You don't get to gloss over that because it's a thing you like. It's just more incentive to talk about it and to address why that was a problem and what we need to do to make it a better environment in the future, which I think is weirdly reflective of this episode in that if you want to make the world better and less of a playground for assholes, you need to start acting on it. And that's, that's all of us's responsibility. Listen, I 100% agree with that. The, the problematic stuff, you can uh, just sweep under the rug and pretend no. like it didn't happen. Uh, you know, and that's, that's true. Of, that's true of a lot of, creators and a lot of art and it's true of humanity like we were talking about with the deep space nine episode just because things are better now doesn't mean we get to pretend that the bad shit didn't happen that's a disservice to everyone who went through it and for all of us who are working still to get past it right and that's one of the beauties of trek shining a mirror to those efforts and and doing a you know pretty uh, measurable job of of standing up to that uh, to those to that level that, that you would want in terms of these uh, yeah, like the number one, troublesome topics. The number one comment that we get at Women at Warp is, I don't understand why you guys talk about Star Trek when you so clearly hate it right. by criticizing <laughs> this and bringing up bad, less than good things that happened. And it's like, yeah. no, well, dude, we're doing that because we love it. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. You don't do yeah. anything any favors by putting it on a shelf behind safety glass. You examine it. You talk about it. You address it. Just like America itself. Exactly. Ryan, how, how about you? You know, you talk about Harlan Ellison, who I always, you know, like, I, as much as I admire his his writing. A brilliant writer, but fucked up dude. Writer, but a fucked up dude. Yep. Very fucked up, who always held humanity at a higher standard than he actually did portrayed himself like he actually carried himself right i know and And that's part of what makes it so ironic and again what ties it back to i think part of the story of this script is that it didn't concept come from him but it went through so much change that he really vocally hated but at the end of the day the change we got makes it this incredible work not just of science fiction but of just human fiction in terms of the future can be changed. You can make the world better. And it all starts with people saying they want to make the world better. To me that I'm sorry that. Sorry to interrupt your, your take, but I'll I'll, just take one quick take on Harlan that when you're that bitter about the, the end product and the changes and, and, but still can't step back to at least acknowledge how good it is. I, that I just have a big problem with that. I always have. And, and Harlan, I read your comic book. It is okay. <laughs> so anyway, keep going, I, Ryan. Sorry. I'm one of those who actually thinks that there is a, a far 
perfect version of this episode that is somewhat between the original teleplay and the actual aired episode because there are bits I like from both. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I do sort of like what Ellison was trying to say about humanity and and that people who you think they are aren't really like who they are. Like they can, you know, like even the most vilest person can have an act of kindness. And that is just the complications of being human. Unfortunately, I do have issue with the way he portrayed the character being a drug dealer. Yep. You could have written a more powerful script about drug addiction, right? But you were just using it as an impetus to get into the real plot. Which feels a little exploitive, doesn't it? Right, it does. It does. And derivative, it just it just lost me. It was like yeah, so it, rote. It's it was very generic. Yes, generic. Um, it's just like, oh, I need a generic bad guy. Exactly. It was, Let me just pull out the drug dealer, right? Yeah. And I just never got why he was so, oh, they change it so all of Star Trek is crap and I'm going to go on... 500 shows and say blah 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 you know you gotta then, wonder about anyone who's that bitter about anything it's pretty it's pretty obvious the reason he did that because that's that's his person that's his personality i mean i've seen him at conventions and i would just would be like oh my god i don't want to spend five minutes with this guy yeah i've met him at conventions a couple of times yeah. and like comic con and stuff especially during when he was working on babylon 5 right he just came off he just he comes off Incredibly arrogant. So arrogant. He's gonna he's gonna sue us from beyond the grave. You know that, right? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ryan, how about you? What is your number one uh, Twilight Zone episode of Trek? They must apply to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Eplubnista. Oh my god, I, <laughs> I cannot believe you're going there. This is awesome. Well, I have to go to the Omega Glory because this is clearly Roddenberry trying to be Rod Serling. Oh my God! Yes, that's this really is good. Yeah, Roddenberry trying to be Rod Serling and missing spectacularly. <laughs> 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 and the fact that Roddenberry originally wrote this to be the second pilot after the cage. Oh yeah, so. Funny. Oh wow! <laughs> and, and the original script is even more like. Oh, I, I've read the original pilot and it is very much, it leans heavily more into this like clear stereotypes of, of, of white savages. And yeah. The quote unquote Oriental, which by the way, as an Asian, <laughs> as a half Asian, Oriental is a carpet, people. It is a carpet. It is a rug. It is not a person. <laughs> so there's a lot of cultural appropriation too, which I, I don't think Roddenberry made this intentionally to actually comment on American cultural appropriation of Native American culture, <laughs> but it just happens to be in the episode, and that's another problematic thing. But the whole reveal of, you know, it's the Yankees and the communist, and they're obviously Chinese, and they're obviously, you know, all this whites, all the Yangs look like, you know, Aryan white blonde blue-eyed it's just it's so much that's either it's either oh heavy-handed or very problematic to look at in inside and then the whole like e plebnisa and they must apply to everyone or they mean nothing yeah. <laughs> although one of shatner's greatest performances as kirk <laughs> or his hammiest if you want uh, but I, but why i picked this episode most of all is not only ron and Barry trying to be rod serling but obviously Roddenberry really trying to go for that that twist, hit you over the head. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. Whereas right. when you get to it, you're like, oh no, it's not so much a, oh as it is a Ugh. yeah. It's like oh no. It's kind of like for me that episode uh, of Twilight Zone because every sci-fi episode, every sci-fi show must do an Adam and Eve episode. Every one of them. Everyone. Probe yeah. seven over and out. Probe seven over and out. Yep. You get to that moment where she's like, I'm Eve, I'm Adam. And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> that was so correct. profound in 1963. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it was profound as more of like, and I watched it as a kid and I'm like, oh, really? Oh, man. <laughs> hey, I watched it when I was 10 years old. I was like, wow, that is amazing. That's on the nose. <laughs> uh, all right, Grace, any take on the Omega Glory? 
<laughs> this is why I picked it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I like how you also went with one where in order to talk about it, we've got to address some really problematic shit. It does feel like a Twilight Zone episode that, that misses though. Yeah. Should I just go to my number one pick? <laughs> Do it. Grace Here like, we go. Out of this one. Here we <laughs> go. <laughs> my number one pick. Five words and a hashtag. The begin actually we're gonna end on a really positive note. This is really Ooh. cool. You're gonna you're gonna Ooh, love this one. You're gonna love this one, Grace. Five words and a hashtag. The beginning of wisdom is hashtag the statement I do not know. And that of course is data in the TNG episode where silence has least from season two of TNG. Yes. And this one's one of my favorites feels like a Twilight Zone episode. They get caught in this kind of eerie, spooky part of space, and they don't know what's going on, and there's this classic uh, score from Ron Jones, and real slow pacing as they're trying to figure out the mystery, and all this weird stuff is happening, and I compare this episode to uh, the episode Stopover in a Quiet Town, which is the episode of Twilight Zone where this man and woman wake up, and they're in this city, and there's nobody there. And they're just running around trying to figure it out and a little bit like rats in a cage. And they realize, oh, there's a little girl who has us in a playpen and we're her pets. And uh, everything in the, in the town is all, you know, paper mache and, and cardboard. So, and the, the, it's kind of that connection where Picard realizes that they're just being, you know, there's somebody watching them. And there's the rats in the cage, and then this creepy Nagilam shows up, kind of the way the little girl shows up. And uh, yeah, I just love that episode. And here's the my cool little trivia to connect to Star Trek. And I cannot believe this because I found this out just by looking at it a little bit. The actress, the lead actress in this episode, is named Nancy Malone. And I saw that name. I'm like, I know, I know that name from somewhere. I know that name. So I looked her up on, just clicked on the wiki link. She had a nice little career. She ended up like being on the production side of things in the eighties. And I didn't really see anything Trek related on, in her wiki. And I was about to close the page. I said, now let me just, let me just do a control F for Trek. And the thing popped up at the bottom that she had, uh, directed two episodes of Star Trek Voyager. You're kidding. And they are awesome oh, episodes. No, the, the actress in Stopover in a Quiet Town directed Coda and Message in a Bottle, oh which are two, two classic, classic episodes. Holy crap. And it's sad. She died of leukemia just like five years ago in 2014. Oh. But I started, started reading about her. And she's like a little bit of this, un, this, a little bit of a forgotten trailblazer. She was the first woman to be vice president of television at 20th Century Fox in the 70s. And oh, wow. yeah, I just was like, so she must have seen some shit. She nope. definitely lives yeah. through the shit. So, uh, but I couldn't believe it. Another weird Star Trek connection on an episode that I was just randomly going to pick regardless. So, it's all uh, connected. where silence has these Nagilum, the creepy Nagilum. Uh, any take on this one, Grace? I'm trying, I'm trying to think of an articulate take. I'm still <laughs> just kind of like, what? What? Nancy Malone, it's super cool. Any take on this one? Actually, Ryan, you got anything quick? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, I actually, okay, so I'm one of those weird ones uh, that love the second season of TNG. Oh, I do too. I the third season. Oh, not more than the third. Uh, I know, the third <laughs> has the strongest back-to-back episodes. I okay. will give it that, right? Okay. But I think here's why I love the second season over the third is is that the second season is actually sort of like the Twilight Zone. True. There's just a lot of creepy episodes. Yeah. There is this real sense that the Enterprise is really out there alone and space is out to fucking kill y'all. Yeah, space is horrifying. Yeah. Space is horrific and it's going to get you. And where silence has least is is like the quintessential episode of that season where it's just like, yeah, uh, we're just toys to space and they're going, it's going to eat us. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I do concur wholeheartedly as Riker said. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I do indeed concur wholeheartedly. Auto-destruct. 
canceled. This one does also really remind me of the Twilight Zone episode where I think it's called People Are Alike All Over, where the the guy ends up in space and they're like, oh, no, this is great. We can't wait to hang out with you, space man. Here's our new house for you. It's a dollhouse. It's a oh, zoo. Yeah. That's right. The zoo. We live in a zoo now. <laughs> Here's some whiskey. Here's some music. <laughs> and then the curtain pulls back and it's. And they're all just staring at him. It's so creepy. Yeah, that's a good one, too. <laughs> that's Roddy McDowell in that episode, too, right? Well, you uh, you obviously love season two because you love Times Square. But <laughs> When Picard kills himself, he doesn't want to deal with it. Okay, let's wrap it up with some secondary systems picks. Let's see what you can do with the secondary systems. Any episode you just want to rattle off quickly, Grace, that we didn't talk about yet? Again, going with original series, I really... Strong contenders were the Enterprise incident and the Naked Time. Oh, also, yeah. what are little girls made of? Just because it's such uh, oh, that's such a sure. what the hell is going on episode. Yeah. It's one of those ones where you can just pick a scene at random and be like, oh, look at all these sci-fi shenanigans. Yep, and I appreciate that's a, that. That's a great one. I didn't think of uh, what a little girl's made of. That's also, perfect. by the end, you're like, wow, Chapel really could have done better. So much better. In terms than, of guys. Than, than Corby. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. Picard, Picard's now basically Roger Corby. Yeah. Ryan, how about you? Any episodes you want to run uh, off? You know what? The only thing that comes to mind is by any other name. Oh, great. Only pick. because it has what I consider the most horrific, horrible, horrible red shirt death where they get where they get distilled to those uh, styrofoam cubes. Oh, and then one of them gets smushed. Oh, and yeah, it's the worst. And that is the creepiest death in all of Star Trek for it me. It is. It stands out because that is like creep level 5000 which is in a lot of twilight zone <laughs> and that does, that does feel like a twilight zone episode when they when they throw the one back and you're like which person is it oh, yeah <laughs> so that's good okay i'm gonna rattle off a few more one of my toughest cuts was transfigurations from tng i compare that to eye of the beholder with the episode where the guy's emerging as a new being and they're trying to stop them because they're afraid of them and i think that's a really an episode that really stands the test of time for for Star Trek in terms of some of the things people deal with now in terms of their identity today. Secondary systems also had attached, uh, like a penny for your thoughts when yeah. Picard and and Beverly are reading each other's mind. I had Coda on my secondary systems before I knew that Nancy Malone directed it because <laughs> there's a big creepy alien just trying to get people to to join them in their own little hell. Mm -hmm. I had vis-a-vis from Voyager, all the crazy body hopping that's happening there. Remember, super underrated episode where Balana kind of relives a Holocaust that uh, it turns out one of the aliens on the ship is kind of pushing into her mind to, mm -hmm. to relay her own guilt. Of course, the inner light, the, big twilight zone reveal at the end when all of his family shows up and they're just, we just want you to know about us. Yeah. And a special shout out to course oblivion from Voyager, which I'm convinced would have been Rod Serling's favorite episode of star Trek. <laughs> because at the end, when you realize this ship of copies of Voyager, just trying to get the word out that uh. they existed and had adventures. And here's what we did. Uh, but you're never going to know about it because Brian Fuller, you bastard. Oh, God. How dare you make me feel this many things in one episode? Yes, that one is uh, amazing. Okay. Wow. Awesome job, you guys. We you bastard, really, I love you. We, we, we <laughs> took really it down. <laughs> we went deep. Let's yeah. get into our quick regeneration cycle and recap our picks. Computer, activate regeneration cycle. Alcoves beta and gamma. Okay, Grace, uh, recap your top five Star Trek episodes. I actually just closed the documents. So now I'm like, oh, what did I have? What did I have? I had, I had Conscious of the King. I had the Corbomite Maneuver. I had Mirror Mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Gideon and and city on the edge of city. forever. Yes, that's what I had. <laughs> it asked me, "Do you want to save document?" I'm like, "I don't need this anymore." You don't need that, Ryan. How about you? Recap your five. I had Charlie X, Far Beyond the Stars, Frame of Mind, 
uh, the enemy within and the Omega Glory, which is in fact glorious. So, and by the way, Grace had all five TOS episodes, which we love as an old school Trekkie. Well, yeah, it felt it felt like the easiest way to tie in Twilight Zone. A perfect fit. And Ryan had three from TOS and then one each from Deep Space Nine and TNG. And my five picks were Allegiance in round five, round four, Things Pass from Deep Space Nine. Round three, Hard Time from Deep Space Nine. Round two, The Survivors from TNG. And number one, where Silence has Lease from TNG. So I had three from TNG, two from Deep Space Nine. Quick recap of the stats. I am not surprised by this. Uh, Only three incarnations of Trek were represented. TOS, TNG, and Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine had three picks. TNG, four and TOS had eight overall selections, which makes perfect sense. As we do every week, we've once again entered a temporal causality loop. So before we can depart, it's time to hear from you. The Enterprise has been caught up in a temporal causality loop, and I suspect that something similar may have happened to you. And for this week's temporal causality loop, we're going back to episode 83 in our Scenes in Trek series with our top five scenes in Sick Bay. Got a ton of great responses. I'm just going to read off a couple of these lists now. Ah, oh, sick! <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> First up, a, a fantastic TOS only list. So that matches what Grace just did. Yes. From Melanie at ShuttlePod2. Number five, space hippies get their examinations in the way to Eden. <laughs> Uh, that is a scene in sick bay to say the least. Space hippies uh, get deloused. Number four, <laughs> number four, Miranda reaches Spock and saves him. Is there in truth no beauty? Number three, the entire ending of Journey to Babel. I picked that one as well. Number two, Chapel confesses her love for Spock in Aww. the naked time. And number one, McCoy versus Khan from Space Sea. That's an awesome pick too. Okay, then we got another classic alliterative list from Rich Masters at Rich Masters on, on Twitter. The Nobulin diminishes dental decay disgrace. <laughs> okay. Hashtag brushes hide blushes to pull its dear doctor from Enterprise. Oh my god, that was impressive. Oh, that I forgot about oh that. Gosh. He was he was <laughs> examining he examined to pull. I had no memory of that. That's amazing. I love a good alliteration, and you have me fucking intrigued. <laughs> Here we go. Number four. <laughs> Bothered Bones breaks biobed banter. Hashtag the last word from Journey to Babel. Oh! oh that's so perfect. good. Number three from The Visitor. Son's sacrifice secures Cisco's safety. Hashtag tell me you'll be okay. I'm going to be crying then. I'm not going to be okay after that one. No, no, no. Number no. two, Romulan rudely refuses Roshenko respite. Oh, I picked this. This is the enemy. This is when in <laughs> hashtag Klingon filth, when the Romulan will not take Worf's blood and Worf won't yeah. give it to him. <laughs> and number one, from latent image of Voyager, Doc's deathly decision develops descent. Hashtag breaking a few eggs. Another, that is a, that's an awesome list from Rich Masters. Okay, and I had one more I was going to relay because I love this standalone pick. It's from Adam Sanders, who is at Mitch fan, 1701, five words and a hashtag, love hurts and love bleeds, hashtag, I don't need that image either. It's Worf and Dax in looking for Parmok in all the wrong places. <laughs> Getting mended up by Bashir, and he was like, ah, I don't want to. <laughs> uh, okay, that was an awesome episode. We love our scenes in Trek series. So, once again, those picks more than enough to get us out of this week's temporal causality loop. So, as always, I want to thank everyone for all your great responses to the Trek Ranks podcast. Please keep them coming to me at Trek Ranks on Twitter so we can retweet them. But we also want to hear from you. So, put together your own list of top five Twilight Zone episodes of Trek or any lists from our past shows. And give us a call at the Tricorder Transmissions at 609-512-5527. Or you can just DM me a link and I can download it and we'll play voicemail. We've been playing a lot of those lately. So hopefully we'll hear from you so you can be featured on the next episode of Trek Ranks. And on the next episode of Trek Ranks, we're doing a really cool topic that I'm very much looking forward to. It's another deep cut topic. It's our top five buzzer beaters. That's right. It's those moments in Trek. Where it's like it's a bit of an action trope, 
saving the day just by beating the clock or the anomaly or some bit of <laughs> techno babble or some, something's counting down to the last second you're going to save the day. It's basically those last second save the day heroics. So Grace and Ryan, I'm going to put you guys on the spot right now. If you had to choose one buzzer beater moment in Star Trek that you can think of off the top of your head, what would it be? Grace, you sound like you're stumped. Uh, buzzer uh, beater, me. a buzzer beater. Uh, uh, oh, oh, I, I know it. Um, pass, pass. Ryan, Ryan, do you have a buzzer beater moment? <laughs> the doomsday machine. Yes. Um, Kirk beams Kirk out. This is beams out at the last minute that his transporter circuits are blowing up and Scotty's in the Jeffries tube yep. trying to get it to work. <laughs> and try it now. I, uh, try it now. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely uh, going to be in the running for me. Okay, Grace. Can I count getting One. the cheese to sick bay? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Sure. I like that. You cheese get to sick bay. Just in time to save the day. Okay. That is awesome. So before we wrap it up here, a huge thanks to Grace Moore and Ryan Little. Great to have you guys on the show for the first time. Any, Thank you so uh, final... much for having me. Yeah, it was Thanks great for having too. us. Great to have you guys. You guys uh, crushed it. Really in depth conversation. Yeah, Ryan, we're the superior guests. Yes, <laughs> we went. We went. We went long. We went long. <laughs> Could be the longest episode ever. We'll see how yes. it comes together. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks everyone for engaging with us here on episode ninety one of the Track Ranks podcast. As always, I want to close by saying I'm looking forward to standing with you again here in this place where I belong, in the Twilight Zone. Just want to remind everyone again that the entire Trek Ranks catalog is available for you to download and listen to at trekranks.com and on your podcast player of choice. Our episodes never get carbon data, so check out the topics you've missed and maybe just want to listen to again over at trekranks.com. And a reminder to check out our friends Five Year Mission at fiveyearmission.net. They're writing a song for every episode of Star Trek, and you won't believe how great their music is. They also have a podcast at the Trek Geeks Network, so seek them out. You won't regret it. Brother Benny, you have walked in the path of the prophets. There is no greater glory. Tell me, please, who am I? Don't you know? Tell me. You are the dreamer. And the dream 